Network. We believe young onset Parkinson's disease does not define you. You define it. Can you tell us what a best boy is? Uh, a best boy is the gaffer's right-hand man um, or woman or person. Um, and the gaffer is the chief lighting technician on the set. He's responsible for all the aspects of lighting, um, either independent of the director of photography or shared with the director of photography or ordered by the director of photography. It just depends upon the relationship of the gaffer and the director of photography. And then my responsibility is to do everything that the gaffer cannot do because he's strapped to the set, answering questions from all the departments and handling lighting and its effects on all departments. And everybody has their two cents they would like to add. So the gaffer weighs through all of that. Well, I am responsible for set power, all of the lights on set, all the lights hanging on set. Uh, a 40 foot truck full of gear, a stake bed full of gear, a 10 ton full of gear, two crews, um, all the time cards, all the hours, balancing the budget, making a budget. Oftentimes the lighting budgets are about 67, 60 to $70,000 a week. Um, and the value of the equipment is in the millions and it's all on my shoulders and it all has to be ready and working perfectly. And when it's not, they come looking for me. With Parkinson's. With Parkinson's for, uh, I was diagnosed in 2010 and was found disabled. I was unable to do my job in 2015. So for five years after diagnosis, which we all know starts before diagnosis, you had I was Parkinson's and you were dealing with this. I had some symptoms with Parkinson's. I thought that my foot, my gait was a problem with a, a plantar fasciitis and was seeking the help of in, in souls and a podiatrist. And uh, I would walk up to 10 miles a day on the lot or more just to do my job. And uh, so my feet were constantly in pain. Um, I was carrying my arm like, Bonaparte, people are like, well, why are you favoring your arm? I don't know why I'm favoring my arm. And then one day I couldn't tear some te duct tape in half. And I was like, something's wrong. And I went and started to look into that. And they f thought I had a cubital tunnel syndrome. And they cut my humerus and moved the nerve over to uh, solve that problem. That was a part, turns out to be a Parkinson's issue and not a, a nerve issue. And when they finally, after almost two years of looking, they sent me to a neurologist who looked at me and in five minutes said, you have Parkinson's and handed me a video, a little DVD called How to Live with Parkinson's, a little cartoon family on the front of it, and a, a sample pack of Mirapex and said, see you later. There was no discussion of like, what does that mean? Like a family guy cartoon. Yeah, like the Family Guy cartoon, exactly. Like, <laughs> exactly that. Um, so I didn't tell anybody at first at work because I wasn't sure, like, how it was going to go over. And then I told my, my boss, the gaffer, um, that I, what was going on. He's like, well, we'll just, we'll just if, as long as you can roll with it and no one can see, then it's fine. And eventually I told the crew and they all kept it to themselves. And then I, I was working on brothers and sisters when this happened. And uh, I finally told production and they were really supportive. I hear that you are a good poet and that you've been doing it since you were a teenager. What is your uh, yeah. biggest inspiration in your poetry? What do you like to write about? What is my biggest inspiration in poetry? Well, Dylan was, was, the biggest inspiration for the longest time. And, and now I've been uh, taking these workshops and, and studying the, uh, the, the people around the beat movement um, and their various ideas like Ginsburg's uh, American sentence and uh, Charles Olson's um, 
projectionist or projection theory stuff. It's really heady stuff and I can't, I'm not really good at explaining it. I, um, what inspires me to write just usually just comes to me. And um, I've been writing a lot of like flash kind of fiction poetry stuff that's very short and tells a story, but is, is, po is poetic. And I've also been doing what's called lyric essays, which are kind of poetic essays. They mix sort of fact and fiction sometimes. Um, and if I might just interrupt you briefly here. Sure. I have heard some things that Miguel has written that made me wonder why I bother writing. They're the kind of things where you drop what you're doing. You forget that you're standing there listening and you're so in the story that you are transported physically into the body of the narrator. And I, I rarely have that experience. And I listen to a lot of writers and I do a lot of writing because I, I call myself a writer. <laughs> and then I, I listen to you and I'm just like, what? What you read at the show that we worked together at in LA recently was just mind boggling. He said, and I quote, you're washing your hair with sand. Can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that? You're just being futile. You're, you're, uh, it was about people being sort of taking the Hallmark card route towards Parkinson's and not just laying it on the line and telling the people what it's really like to have it or having doctors not really telling you what to expect. There's this sort of like fear of, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a no happy ending disease. It's, 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 there's no happy ending. So why do we have to pretend about this? It doesn't mean we can't be happy and find joy, but why should we be untruthful and un dishonest about our experiences? Um, and that sort of brings me to what I'm really surprised about is for most, most idiopathic uh, Parkinson's is probably caused by some sort of toxin or uh, unclean environment. And uh, if that's the case, why isn't Parkinson's at the forefront of the environmental movement? Why isn't the environmental movement behind people who have Alzheimer's or uh, Parkinson's or other kinds of diseases? And why aren't we banding together and just like not allowing these companies or these that make these toxic chemicals and dispense them with impunity I, yes you in front <laughs> mike <laughs> that must be me okay i'm mike um so miguel let's talk a little bit more about the toxins now were you exposed to trichloroethylene i was i used it daily for eight years it was carried in the aircraft as a as a troubleshooting uh device and we use it to wash our hands at the end of the day. Um, it was constantly used. There was nowhere you could be, if, the, if there was a plane being worked on or a helicopter being worked on, TCE or trike or trichloroethylene was present at all times. Now you're in the military? Yeah, I was in the Coast Guard for 10 years. Where were you stationed? I was stationed at in, out right out of boot camp, I was stationed in New Orleans, and then I got uh, to go to my school, my training school, which was an aviation electrician uh, school in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And from there, I went to Puerto Rico, and I was stationed there for four years. And then I was sent to Los Angeles, and I was stationed at LAX for four years. Do you know the military has... I've talked to many people in, mil in the past military who have, who have used trichloroethylene. And they have Parkinson's all, or cancer, even worse. Right. Well, I, I could end up with cancer. It doesn't... The funny thing is, is we, we have Parkinson's and we think, well, maybe we're not going to get anything else because we've got that one thing take... We got that slot filled, you know, but it doesn't mean we can't get something else along the line. And, yeah. And, Comorbidities, and right? 
Pardon me? Comorbidities are common. Comorbidities. Yeah. He's writing it down. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out this trimethyl. Blah, blah, blah. It you sounds know, like it, a chemical. It's also known as dry cleaning solvent. How yeah. it works is, is you, for electrical con- connectors or even cleaning anything on the aircraft, you can spray it and it immediately disappears. The grease, it, 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 it evaporates it into the air. You don't have to wipe it down. Except you've absorbed it into your organic oh, cell. Yeah, yeah. And it isn't dry chlorothalene, TRTC. It affects central nervous system. Is that true? Yes. I, I believe does, so. Does the military recognize it as a, uh, for, for disability purposes? It finally just recognized it with this new pit burning uh, bill that came out, and it, but it only recognizes it at, if you've been stationed at Camp Lejeune yep. up to one day, like as, as, as little as one day to as long as X amount of time from the 50s through the late, I don't know, 80s. late 80s. Late yeah. 80s. And it's only if you're at Camp Lejeune because it's in the groundwater. So you would have to have ingested it. That's the only way. And if you, if you, if you work in the work environment and it's around you, they haven't approved it so you have to f- legally fight them for the uh for the claim and I'm in, I'm in the process of doing that i lost my first claim and we're we're uh, appealing and it'll probably lose again and then it'll need to be appealed like i think it's like it's like three to four times you have to do this it takes a while for it to to go through yeah. um you know I, I think the va is a is a is a very important organization in our country if, especially if we're going to war all the time we should we should support the troops with all the health care and everything that they need if they're if, and i think they're trying their best but it's a really uh, uh what i want to say it's a uh, it's a boggled down bureaucracy it's it's a little hard to move quickly through it because everything has every, there's a rule for everything. Yeah. Right. Now you'd mentioned that um, there's not much uh, done between these chemical companies and the environmentalists, as far as keeping this stuff out of our environment. And what, what do you think can be done about that? What, what do you have in mind as a solution to help stave that off? I, I think that think the organizations like Michael J. Fox and the Parkinson's Foundation, the APDA, and all these others, they should all join the environmental movement. They, in, instead of just having 5K runs for Parkinson's, they should have 5K runs for, you know, uh, fracking or, or for um, uh, the, the water in Detroit or where, you know. Uh, where I'm they, from, I'm from Flint. Yeah, we we uh we had our, our our water completely destroyed here. Our our public supply was uh full of lead, and many kids had their lives completely destroyed by it. So I, I like that you actually threw Michigan in the mix. We could use some help for sure. Where is Aaron Brockovich? I don't know. We've got, we've got Miguel. We're good. <laughs> Miguel. Miguel has a cast of characters that he calls friends that are amazing that I had the great opportunity to meet when we were doing the personality crash for Safi in LA. Can you talk a little bit about where you've met some of these people? For example, the guys that also do similar things to what you did and how they see your Parkinson's or how you perceive them to see your Parkinson's, like how your friendships have been. Well, I met, uh, I met Dave on a, that's Dave Slodkey. I guess I can say his name. Um, I met him on a Japanese production called uh, Blue Tiger. It had Virginia Madsen, Michael Madsen, and, and Harry Dean Stanton. I was blessed to have met all three of them, and in particular, Harry Dean, who is one of my favorite actors. Um, so we met on that show. I met... Uh, I met Stefan on a show called Inferno, which was a Jean-Claude Van Damme picture being shot. And I got, I went out only for two weeks. They were shooting at night in the desert and he and I had the 
just a ball working on that film because it was it was just nuts and uh they had a scene where they had this like f-18 fighter jet flying just above the telephone poles down a highway and we were supposed to clear the set for that and they weren't we weren't supposed to be allowed anywhere near where this was going to happen in case there was an accident and we we hid so it would fly right over us and not only did it fly right over us it, it went like this just a, almost directly over, not over us because we would have been burned but very close and very exciting um stefan's a great a great fellow as, as is dave and uh i don't know where i met david kagan but uh we worked on some i went to uh santa fe new mexico to work on thor and went to detroit and stayed in De dearborn to work on a show called jimmy p a french production with benicio del toro and matthew almerick um so does that answer the question yes and thank you for taking me to the set of it was bob hart alba Shoa. Yeah, that was wild to watch how many takes are done on some of these sitcoms. I didn't realize that there were 45 people in the room and that these actors are trying to stay focused with things moving all around them. It was like a swirl. To watch them break down the set like that and put the lighting back up and change everything and focus on the lighting was fascinating to me. Um, I can't believe the amount of work that goes into that. So yeah, it would be hard with Parkinson's. So when were you diagnosed exactly? 2010 around the around the new year okay um, gonna, yes i was gonna say that when you start talking about the movies and the people that you know in the business your eyes lit up <laughs> what was it like to how'd you feel when you did when you had to retire when i had to retire um it was hard because we work usually no less than 12 hours a day and, and easily between 14 and 16 hours a day from start to finish. And when you're on an episodic TV show, which is most of what I've done, you're working with people for six to nine months. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you develop these friendships, um, and your people skills are, are actually the, probably more important than your technical skills because you have to work with these people. You basically, they're your family. You don't, you don't see your family when you're working on a film or a TV show. They're, your family is the crew because that's who you're spending all your time with. Um, and so the loss of that was very, was very difficult. Um, but fortunately I have really good friends and I had a really good crew and they stood by me and uh, still to this day stand by me um, if I need anything or just to talk or, or whatever, they're there. Um, I, I, I couldn't be luckier. Yeah, the, these people really rolled out the red carpet for me, you guys. When I was just a visitor, they didn't know me. I was just a friend of yours and they treated me so well. I mean, door to door service, which I didn't get from. Um, anybody that is, you know, a certain organization. Yeah. <laughs> that shall go on name. But you know what? People do make mistakes. And I believe that that organization that was not in the of their work. But I will say this to be there and watch Safi's work. And for everybody who's listening, it's called Personality Crash. This woman took care of her father for the last year of his life. She also documented it. He had sundowners, he had dementia, he had Parkinson's. And she, she did this with great. She allowed him great dignity. It was a beautiful piece. And as we were standing there, I was just sobbing looking at these images. And she had this, what was it? This um, audio? Yeah, she had an audio uh, portion to the exhibit that you, as you walked past certain photographs, you would key this device and you could wear a headset and it would put, she would read from her journal entry that related to the photograph or photographs in the area of the, of the sensor. Which 
makes us wonder, though, why aren't we talking more about this? Are we afraid to talk about the end of life? Are we afraid to talk about caregiving and how we might need help someday? I think? am. I Absolutely. am. Uh, Get me go to your show. <laughs> no, it's your show. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know who's more afraid, us who have Parkinson's or those who care for us. I think that the people who care for us are more terrified by it than we are because we, we have we have to look at it. We we can't. There's no for there's nowhere for us to go, but but through it and uh, but people who care for us they they can stop coming around or leave our leave the relationship or um, you know deny what's happening and not that we have, I mean, I, I denied for, for a while, my Parkinson's. Um, but uh, the fact that our med medical system doesn't have long-term care written into it, like to, to get long-term care in California, I think you have to be, you have to have Medi-Cal and uh, which means you have to give up all your assets to the state so they can, take care of you. I don't know what it's like in other states, but I don't imagine it's much better or it could be even worse um, unless you, you know, take out a policy for long-term health care, which are, those are not cheap, I understand. Um, yeah. If we're not, not going to do anything about changing the environment and making it less toxic, and reducing the numbers of us who are going to be coming down with this disease as they, they're saying it's on the rise, right? That's the pandemic. Yeah. pandemic. Yeah. So if they're not going to do anything at that end, they better start doing something at the other end and, and, and take care of us. And, you know, in the end game, I think we have a lot of, uh, just have to roll up our sleeves and, have several battles in front of us from legislative to, you know, various uh, addressing various policies that are not good for our health. No, well, Massachusetts, we have something called Medicaid, Medicare. I'm on Medicaid, I'm on Medicaid is, yes, it's no last, like $2,000 in assets. So if this gets too bad, we talk to, you know, to a lawyer. He set us up. Well, my wife's going to have all the money in her name. I'm going to have $2,000 in my name. So I get state care that way. So, so, so it's the only way we're going to get by. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully, fingers crossed, those policies don't change in the next yeah. five years or ten years. Because, you know, as we're, as we're seeing... And I'm not making any political statements other than the fact that there's just a lot of policy change going on and, and we don't know what's going to happen. And the, the economy is kind of questionable. And um, there's just a lot of question. Why yes, would we be anxious or have any depression? <laughs> we get hit chemically and we get hit causally. So outside of us, things are beyond our control. Inside of us, things are beyond our control. Can yeah. you talk about the process of having to let go of control of anything and everything? What does that feel like? I, I, I've had a hard time with that. I mean, I, 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 start, I'm, I had to work really hard at not being a backseat driver, <laughs> you know, um, and to try and control, I try and control everything. That's, that's what I, that probably causes me the greatest amount of anxiety is getting involved in trying to control everything. But I'm learning slowly that, uh, letting go of that is the best thing I can do. Um, then you can just relax. And most of the stuff is just is, is not even worth your time thinking about, but you don't know that until you, you're facing it. And right. Parkinson's is, is a, it's, it's such a, it hits on so many levels and, you know, 
I don't know if you guys have this experience of going to the doctor and they're like, so how are you feeling? What's going on? And you start to run down this list and you can see the doctor's eyes kind of glaze over as it's more than more than two things. It's like, you know, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. And that's just the, the, the non caught. That's just the motor stuff. We haven't got to the, to the cognition, to like the mental issues that are happening. And, and it's, it's, I often wonder why anybody becomes a movement disorder specialist because it just seems to be kind of a masochistic role, you know? Um, and that brings me to, uh, we had a discussion at, at, at the uh, exhibit, the personality crash about palliative care. And the fact is, is that from day one, from the day you're diagnosed till the day you pass, it's all palliative care. That we don't have anything else but palliative care to be offered Parkinson's people. You know, you have that in hospice. Those are your two choices. I think it's all the whole neurological area. Everybody with a neurological illness is going through the same thing. Yes, yes. Agreed. ALS and, and, and such, yes. Miguel, do you have a, like, you fall back on religion or anything like that? Say again, please. Nathan, do you hear me? Want to help out? I did, yeah. Do you, do you hold any religious views or anything that help you out? Um, I'm a, a dabbler in Zen Buddhism and do a lot of uh, meditation and breathing exercises to help kind of keep my mind from wandering into places it shouldn't go. Are you also taking care of your father? Ish. He's, he, he, he does probably more to take care of me than I of him. He's 90 years old and just came back from nine weeks in France with two friends who were in their late fifties and they spent a month in uh, Paris and then the next five weeks traveling the south of France and going to wineries. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's an amazing person. He's constantly learning something every day. He's got YouTube on, he's learning like, well, how do they make uh, French bread or <laughs> how do they, you know, how, what's a catalytic converter? Why are people stealing? You know, it's just, he, he's always just looking at stuff and, and learning and it's quite, it's quite impressive. That's probably something we could all take away from him. And that, that curious mind, I think, keeps the mind young, doesn't it? The more we seek, the more knowledge we have, the longer we can keep it. Yeah, well, he's, he's going on a road trip across country here in, in June with, his, with, a, with a friend of his. So, I mean, he's... 90, you said? He's 90? He just turned 90. He's going to be turning 91 this coming December. Wow. Life goals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, most of his contemporaries are no longer here. A lot of us could say that, too. Already we're noticing the voices that get quieter. Like when I first came into this Parkinson's world, I had my sort of, um, I was a fan of certain people, you know, like I would follow them. They've gotten very quiet. One of them has sort of disappeared. Um, and I'm not just talking about disappeared from social media. I mean, like disappeared, like I can't reach them anymore. Um, and then another one I know chose to end their life and some things like that. However, the people that I really get excited about are the people who come hell or high water, stay connected. I feel like that's the answer to living a quality life longer. And you have so many friends. Everybody here does. Ned, Nathan, Mike, like you guys have a lot of friends and we do all stay connected. We support each other. Like we take turns. Like I remember when I was down one day and you were down one day. You said, today's my day to be down, and I supported <laughs> you, and vice versa. How would you recommend anybody listening support somebody with Parkinson's if they have it too? What can we do for each other? I think the biggest thing is just to be heard um, and to be able to just speak. You know, when someone, when someone asks, these friends ask, how are you doing, to really tell them, like, I'm feeling this, 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 and this, you know. Um, and to have them just listen and not try to go, well, have you tried ayahuasca? Um, 
<laughs> All these housewives in their kitchens having ayahuasca ceremonies are help, helping us. Any. But, you know, it, people are well-intended, but I don't think they realize, you know, how many times we've heard the offered solution, you know, for our condition. Um, I, I just smile and say, you know, yeah, that sounds, I'll look into that. Because uh, it just it ends up not being worth trying to say, well, nobody really knows how well turmeric works or like no thanks i had an aunt that died the same way right like what do you say you know what is the most outrageous thing that you've had someone tell you like as an example i just think someone's told me like to help you with your parkinson's <laughs> was it from a doctor <laughs> oh geez that's that's a tough one um the word help was definitely in air quotes well i guess i I, can, I don't know about the most outrageous thing but i don't think people realize that uh unsolicited advice is criticism mm. oh. and that maybe they they should they should not offer advice to somebody who's got a chronic degenerative incurable brain disease and has had it for a little while that they've probably already been down all of these roads because that's how we all get to where we are right now. We've all ran down those roads of, well, will this help? Will that help? I've heard this will do it. I mean, we want to live. We want to be cured. We're, we're, we're not sitting idly by as this disease progresses. We're trying to find something that will make us at least comfortable at the minimum comfortable and that is a that is a daily battle yes i should have thrown this in there when i tried dps surgery out to play cards my friends and one of my friends is not that bright he goes to me did they get it i'm like what are you talking about like, did they get the parkinson's uh, <laughs> he, like he thought they had to go in my brain and take something out <laughs> Well, that would be easy, wouldn't it? That would that would that all it was just a matter of going in and cutting it out. Wow. That just speaks to what the layman's view of this disease is. People don't understand. And from their perspectives, of course, people want to help. They want to give us advice that they think is useful. It's unfortunate though that that advice comes from a, a faulty perspective. I, I remember myself before Parkinson's, uh, I would probably try and give somebody with Parkinson's advice now, being in this mode. I would never, uh, unless they came and asked me, of course, just because I've had that happen so many times where people just, they know it all, uh, you know, uh, you've never experienced this brain disorder one day in your life, don't know anything about it, but all of a sudden you've got diet tips for me. <laughs> I, I don't understand where it comes from <laughs> yeah. other than it's, they're trying to help, but the perspective is just not there. I read an interesting article once called how to, how to not say the wrong thing. And the gist of the article was the person with the malady is at the center of a concentric group of circles. The closer you are to that center, the more you can do something other than offer um, air or, uh, you know, um, just support. So the, 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 uh, the premise was you can dump out, but you have to care in. And um, it, I, it's helped me tremendously since ha having read that. A friend of mine who is uh, going through a very rare form of cancer treatment, um, she, she was the one that identified it for me. A and I find myself caring in far more than I dump out. That's good. Love that. It's really good. I'm going to take yeah. that with me. I think um, it's also just important not to be afraid to ask for help. I still, I mean, being the jobs that I did in, in the film business required me to solve almost all the, you know, work on my own and solve the problems on my own. Um, they had, my crew had this joke that says, I am Sanchez and I need no help. Um, now, uh, 
I'm not afraid to ask for help and I'm not afraid to ask for directions. I'm not afraid to uh, tell people like if I'm at the checkout counter and I'm struggling with my wallet or struggling with something and shaking. It's like, I did, they, they're looking at me and it's like, I have Parkinson's. I just, I don't hold back telling people what's going on. I, I want people to know. I think it's important that more people to know that they're encountering somebody with this disease, the better it is for us and our cause. And do you find yourself over explaining to people about Parkinson's? Over explaining? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, th I think it, you have to kind of know your audience and, 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 and sense like how much information do you, do you, do they, are they able to handle or is, is this the time for a big explanation or is it just a quick lesson bullet point kind of thing? Um, I, I worked really hard on trying to get people to understand who are close to me um, and people are only capable of understanding what with all the things they got in their lives that they're trying to deal with, you know, house notes and kids and cars and jobs and whatever else relationships that people can only handle so much information, no matter who they are, whether they're immediate family or close friends. And you just have to kind of bear that in mind. You just remind me of that meme. Someone gets a text and it says, I'm here for you. And the person responds with, oh, my God, I'm so glad because this, this, and this happened. I've been going through this, and I talked to my therapist about this. And the next line is, this is your Uber driver. <laughs> you know, you know, we want to unload, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Hey, I've had some really good discussions with Uber drivers. Right? <laughs> yeah. The audience. Yeah. So I, had go. I had a crazy, Yes. Um, we were, go ahead, Nate. Oh, I wasn't going to say anything. I'm interested to hear about this crazy Uber driver now. <laughs> I had a crazy Uber driver in Mexico City. I went um, to Mexico City to see if back in 2016 to see if I could travel on my own. And I went there by myself. Um, and I... I it was fairly, it was very successful. I went for 10 days and then I came back and, uh, later and a few months later and stayed for almost two months. But, um, I got this Uber ride back from the museum of anthropology, back into the historic center of town where I was staying. And this guy was driving crazy. And then I noticed that he had shut off the, uh, what is the thing that says he's engaged? He's, he's actively working. There's a monitor or something that was off. And so we were just like, we drove past the turn where we were supposed to go to my hotel. And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't right. And the guy was increasing, becoming increasingly agitated and he was sort of pulling his hair and driving and we got stopped. Fortunately, in Mexico City, you can't drive very fast or far because it's just constant traffic everywhere you go. And uh, we were we were stopped in traffic, and I looked up, and there were two federales in full body armor, foot to head, with with M16s, and I just opened up the door and ran to them, and he just went off on his way and. That was the that scary. I had a similar situation happen in Oaxaca, um, where my cab driver decided to take a detour to the airport through some rough neighborhood. I was on that guy's seat. I was in the back seat. I, I almost had him in a chokehold. I was right in his ear, like, get me out of here now, because you never know. You hear stories that they pull up next to a shack and all of a sudden people come out and you're gone and they're, your family's getting a note for a ransom. Right. Um, that's that's what was going through my mind. Was that something similar going through your mind when you were with him? Well, I, I was, and and um, you know, I was basically told, and I and I followed this rule except for this one time, coming back from the Museum of Anthropology, that, that basically not to take anybody. There was like I forgot what the you were not supposed to get into any cabs or Ubers or anything unless they were from certain. Like if you got them at your hotel. That was fine because they would be accounted for. 
but just out in the public, you had to choose you had to, I forgot what way you got a ride back that wasn't calling Uber. I think it was certain cab company or two cab companies that were reliable, you know, that they wouldn't, you know, somebody didn't just paint their car to look like that company or, um, yeah, that I was in Oaxaca and, uh, for, for day of the dead. Oh, cool. A, fr a friend met me and we went to another town to look for this day of the dead celebration in this l little cemetery. And it was the most interesting cab ride in the sense that the cab driver was trying to follow our directions. And then he was asking people and we, we, we ended up in a field with, with fences all around and we had to hang our do a U-turn. It was pitch black came back, drove past a bus stop, was out in the middle of nowhere with one person standing at the bus, waiting for the bus. I was like, where is this person going? There's nothing around here. And he asked this person for directions. And eventually we were getting a little bit nervous, but he found the cemetery. And it was, uh, it was a really interesting cemetery. Everybody was buried in mounds of dirt. They weren't um, uh, like typical covered like uh, what we know as cemeteries or with crypts that are in the level of the ground. Um, it was just- Did he hand you a shovel? Pardon me? <laughs> Were you handed a shovel? No, but there was, a, there, was a, there was a dog and a very, very old couple who were going from grave to grave, sweeping them and putting flowers on them. And uh, it, was, it was surreal. Um, and it was worth the trip and the, and the crazy, not sure where we're going cab ride. Now that sounds like a Fellini film. Well, how did you like Oaxaca? Did, I, I really liked Oaxaca. I loved it. it it's, a, it's a complete immersion in the culture and it's a different culture than the rest of Mexico, of course. You've got 17 different cultures there within one city. What, what I found uh, striking was the lack of Americans. There was nobody from America in Oaxaca while I was there. I saw maybe one or two Europeans. But other than that, if you didn't speak Spanish, you were a little bit screwed. You, um, there weren't a whole lot of uh, English-speaking Mexicans down there. Um, it's oh. not, not a place people from America normally go. Also, uh, most, a lot of people are speaking mixed tech or, or some other indigenous Zap language. Zapoteca, yeah. Zapotec, yeah. And they have a, they have a kind of a matriarchal society. Um, I went with a, I met a friend while I was there. I wasn't, I wasn't totally alone. Um, and uh, she had belonged to this organization that loaned money to indigenous women to start businesses. Oh. We took a, van ride up into the mountains up into like these steep ass mountains there was no flat surface in this town it was just up and down up and down <laughs> and we went to uh to see this woman who got borrowed money to make aprons like there's there's these unique aprons that belong to this particular group of of uh mixed texts and so we were invited into her house where it was all dirt floors in the kitchen. There was this enormous, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, where you, you pay homage to the dead. It's like flowers and candles and... Um, altar. Altar, that's the word I'm looking for. This altar was gorgeous and took... And they made us hot chocolate and they made... Um, I think they made like some kind of quesadilla or something, but... These people had nothing and they gave us hot chocolate and quesadillas. And it's just like. Exactly. That's the culture that you run into down there. The, they, they have everything actually more, more than what we have. We're talking about material goods. When you take away all the material goods in a society, they, they tend to have much closer connections with yeah. each other. Um, and that's one thing I noticed. We, so I went down there with a group of uh, trainers, other people who have Parkinson's, and we met up with Susan, who runs the Par Parkinson's outreach in Oaxaca. Um, and we worked with them for about a week. And the most giving people in the world, and just like you said, the floors were dirt. They had nothing, but we had a meal every day 
with the family. We had a, a parade thrown for us. They told us we we're going to go for a walk. And these people showed up in dresses with big, huge pinatas on sticks, bands. Everybody was dancing. There was a mezcal distributor that was handing out shots to people. It was just a party. And literally for no other reason than that we were there. That's the only reason they threw the party. Is the coolest, coolest, coolest atmosphere I've ever been in was in Oaxaca for sure. Was that with Gavin Mogan? It was, yes. He was my roomie for that trip. Miguel, you have to meet Gavin, by the way. Note to self. I need to meet meet all of you. Um, I would love to go down to to Oaxaca and work for a Parkinson's organization. That would be awesome. Yeah, I'll put you in contact with Susan. She's got some good stuff going down there. Um, they have an outreach that that really impacts their community because there's nothing else. They don't have any other resources down there. So she's opened her doors up for exercise, for social gatherings, for just about anything. So Susan is a, a psychiatrist by trade and then she has Parkinson's herself. Oh, wow. And what you what we what we're talking about about the family environment, what I witnessed with her family was just magical. Her son basically um runs everything um as far as the family goes he was darting back and forth running things from mom to dad making sure that she was good dad was good that all of the things were basically he was a gaffer <laughs> for the entire <laughs> um time that we were there um so it, it it was cool though also to see the other couples who showed up and there were people who were there by themselves but we had the most beautiful couples um and i'm friends with some of them now on facebook it's cool to, to to see their pictures and whatnot but i remember watching the caretakers and they were absolutely enthralled by the teaching they were learning as much as they possibly could to take what we were teaching them so that i knew they were going to take it home and actually work on it with these people now i don't get that sense a lot of times when i work with people up here in the states I don't get the sense that their care partner is as involved as what I was witnessing down there in Mexico. I think it's a cultural aspect. I, I think that there's just something ingrained in the culture down there that is way better equipped to handle chronic illness within the family setting than what we are in America. Well, I think you, you hit the nail on the head back when you said that when you have no material things that you have to rely on each other in a, in a much deeper way than than you would if you had everything at your fingertips and from that aspect it's almost seen throughout the world that america just has it made and we've got all the resources in the world but in this regard those resources are detrimental right 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 yeah the um i have a friend who's an icu uh cardiac ICU nurse and she volunteers to do work and she's gone to Mexico. She's gone to, uh, she went to Puerto Rico when they got hit by Maria. She went to the Bahamas when it got hit by, I don't know which one it flattened the Bahamas. And then she went to India and she says in all those scenarios, just even just giving a person a, a bottle of water, if that's all you could do, people were, were very grateful where like, here her, her encounter would be like how come it's not evian mm -hmm. yep but it's the opposite of the border control people used to take water away yeah where's the human back to parkinson's briefly here where's the humanity in our medical providers what oh, happens are they just down that road you know, but but another question would be, what can you do right now about things like that? Can you change doctors when you're not happy with your doctors? Can you? Change you should always change doctors if you're not happy with your doctor. That's mm -hmm. that's absolutely key. And what for whatever reason it might be, um, you know, I uh, I got a neurologist fairly recently, and in my intake with this neurologist. He he had he had an intern with him. The you know he said, do you mind if the intern sits in on the intake? And I was like, no, bring him in. And so the the intern sitting to my left and the doctor sitting in front of me to my right. And he's got his head buried in the computer and he's typing down everything I'm saying. And he's he's doing a a, a really good job. And then he does you know runs you through the 
thing. Chicken and, dance. And, yeah. Runs me through that. And then he breaks out the little, little rubber hammer that you hit to see if your foot going to kick out. He does that and he starts to put the, the little hammer away. And I said, Hey doc, I, I think that thing's broken. I think you, I think you need to get it recalibrated. And the intern started guffawing and the doctor turned, looked over his shoulder at me and said, I have no sense of humor. <laughs> and, uh, then I, you know, I was like, I don't know if I, if I, if I want to, work with this guy because you got to at least have a sense of, I mean, if I can have a sense of humor, doc, you should be able to have a sense of humor. But then I, I realized this was just after the COVID lockdown had been kind of eased up on. And I thought maybe this guy's just been through hell with this COVID shit and, and he has no sense of humor, rightfully so in that case. That's what I had. What do people have to drive three to four hours just to find an neurologist do? They can't change us like that. Yeah, the, the, the only, I think the only really, really good answer for that is the telemedicine. The, the, that stuff is, you know, you know and if you, have, if you have DBS, and I guess you would have to get one of those remotely programmable Wi-Fi, you know, thingamabobs. Um, for that to work, that's really hard. Uh, I have a, I, I'm living up in Napa. I'm down in LA, came down to LA for this event with it, uh, with uh, Heather. But getting any kind of help in LA, I got to drive into SF, into San Francisco or down to Berkeley or over to, you know, uh, I got to drive at least 30 miles to get a, uh, movement disorder specialist and that's that can be kind of harrowing depending upon where you are and your your on and off period and you know just how you're feeling or maybe you're feeling sleepy because you know your medicine's acting a particular way at this particular time you, you know those are difficult things and and, and yeah and, and you know also in what you're speaking with they're reducing the amount of rural hospitals and rural care facilities are being cut back. It's like, I, I don't know what these poor folks are going to be doing. They're going to have to drive or fly to get real help. That, that's horrible. Sounds like a great plan after a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> what is it What is it that brings you joy lately? I just was curious if you're having any highlights. Yeah, if you want to talk about it, you go. Joy? Well, I went out with... Uh, you met... Candace and uh, Carrie and Dave. And so we went out last night for, for dinner, <laughs> Hilarious. which was just a hoot. And then we went to a bar, which was even more of a hoot. Um, hanging out with my friends gives me a lot of joy and talking to my friends and doing stuff like this. I get great joy. I, I get a lot of joy. And I would like more people with Parkinson's in my life. I need, I, it's hard for me to gather them up and, uh, that would be really joyful. Writing and, and taking pictures is joyful. Being outside in nature is joyful. Seeing my grandson is joyful. Um, grandson? Yeah, I have a grandson. What's my, son and, my son and his wife, uh, they live in uh, Chicago with my grandson. Near you, near you, Ned. And near me. You guys are out, in, you guys are out that way? I, I'm about 150 miles southwest of Chicago in a place called Peoria. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that town. Looks yeah. like we might have to do a road trip. Yeah, we sure. might have to. Well, don't stop there. Come right on up to Flint. I'm not too much further. I'd love to go. Not too much. Just, a, just another five, six, seven hours. <laughs> not that bad. <laughs> You can drive to Boston after that. I'm up, I'm up there, Boston. Why not? That's not much further. We'll just go through Canada. Yeah, why not? So oh, you're in Canada? No, I'm, I'm right next to Canada. We've got a lake between us is all. Oh, yeah. The, the, the 20 percent of the world's fresh water comes from those lakes. Yeah. And for some reason, um, the pl politicians in Flint decided to gather water from a nasty river for our people rather than all of that fresh water that surrounds us. It's insane. <laughs> Yeah, all you have to do is just put a pipe in the ground and flow right into your house. 
Yeah, we're kind of just a big sandbar here. Our, our wells are about 30 feet down. We're <laughs> so not shady. Go get it. Not yeah. at all, right? It's true, though. But uh, so when you listen to music, Miguel, what, what, what do you usually listen to? What do you gravitate toward? Oh, um, lately I've been listening to Roberta Flack. Mm. Killing me softly. She has yeah, ALS. She did? She just announced it. Roberta Cleopatra Flack is one of my favorites. She's amazing. Oh. Uh, I, I, I do all kinds of crazy stuff. I went and got all, there's a collection of records called the Ethiopiques. And it's the whole history of Ethiopian music from like the late 50s till now. And Ethiopians got some serious stuff going on with their interpretation of sort of rock and roll and jazz and then their own, you know, uh, country's influence on, on the you know, traditional music influences. It's really great stuff. Um, I was listening to uh, Grant Green, who's a, uh, an organ player uh, from the 60s. Um, was her name ZSA, ZZA? Z, she's a, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I never know how to say that either. <laughs> she's great. Um, ZA. What was? Nathan took off. Oh, bye. I just <laughs> dropped something into the um, chat, and I want to know if this person is. From Ethiopia, I'm just going to say the name as well as I can. The song is Tizita, which means nostalgia, apparently. Mulatu Astake. Boy, did I butcher that name. Anyway, this is what I think of when you say Ethiopian music. It's sort of a West, West African jam of jazz. Anyway, you know so much about music. And how is that? Are you a musician? Not really. Um, I... I... I can hold a bass and make sounds out of it. Um, and I, I played the harmonic a little bit, but I grew up around music and it was, it was a big part of my life as a teenager and spent most of my money going to, to see music, uh, everything from, you know, Muddy Waters or uh, Clifton Chenier or the, um, darn it now, I can forget any of these people's names. Um, the Buzzcocks and Dead Kennedys and yeah. Ned Smile, Ned, 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 Ned Smile over there. You guys have a lot in common. Yeah. So uh, anything, I mean, I went to see a lot of reggae. My brother, who was two years younger than me in, in the 70s, was listening to reggae and like uh, um, King Sonny a day. And who's the guy from the, the Nigerian uh, sax player? Um, um, mm. God dang it. I know. I'm doing the same thing. It's driving me crazy. I'm going to have to look it up. I'm going to cheat. What's Our memory is not what it used to be. Do we he have like. He had a huge, huge band and he was very political. He was, he was always being. And uh, Ginger Baker played in his band for a while. Yes. Um, Darn it. So and he died, he died of AIDS. Um, the heck was his name? I know exactly what you're talking about. He was listening to this stuff in, in like 1975 when nobody was listening to it. And there wasn't even a section in the, in the record store. And he would come home, you know, my parents would come home from work and this guy would be on the, on the stereo. And Well, I was five. So I was listening to like Zoom <laughs> and Romper Room and Sesame Street. But I'm with you. <laughs> I, I love music and uh, I just wish my memory was better because there there's just so much I would, I would be able to recite if I, my memory were, were. Is it Fela, Fela Kuti? Fela no? Kuti. That's it. Fela Kuti. I didn't even have to look. I, it came to me. Woo! His son is playing in his stead. His name is Fema Kuti. Yes. Yeah. That's the one that I'm familiar with. Yeah. People are more familiar with him as in wow. post Fela. Like the Winton Marsalis people. It's like all the Marsalises. Yeah, exactly. Not to be confused with Marsalis Wallace. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Pulp Fiction. Oh. Just a character. Anyway, back to Parkinson's. What pearls of wisdom can you leave with our listeners? 
about Parkinson's? Well, the good thing about it is, is, it's, is it's always changing. So if you think you're feeling one way, it's gonna, you're going to be feeling another way soon. Um, and that uh, with that lesson is just that everything's changing, nothing is permanent. And because everything is changing and nothing is permanent, everything is possible. And we can create our own possibilities as best we can. We, we're, even though we were talking about not letting go and not being in control, there are things we can do for ourselves that, and with your own imagination, what, what, I, what I may do may not be what you do and what you do may not be what I do, but it works because it's, you figured it out. We all have to figure out our own way with this disease, which I find really interesting because what, what, pill you take and you take and you take is going to react differently than the same pill I take. And we have to figure all that out. Like, well, I got dry mouth. I'm constipated. I, you know, I can't see because it messes with my blood pressure, you know, um, that you aspect side of, effects on some of these drugs and you're like, yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not good at this, but I would say exercise is probably the exercise and diet are the two most important, but it's, I'd actually add a third exercise, diet, and socialization. You need to be around people. You need to be doing things, whether it's just walking to the cafe and talking with somebody or going to the beach or going to a movie or going out to look at trees or playing chess, if you, you know, whatever it may be, the socialization things are really important. And if you can't, be physically with somebody, you can call them up on the phone and talk to them. I've, I can't tell you how many times I was in an anxious state and just getting on the phone and talking to a friend and not just going, I'm anxious, help me. But you just, the conversation eventually moves into something that's got nothing to do with anything. You're talking about some, remember when we went to the movies and that person spilled popcorn on your head and you know, you're, you're, you've now been taken out of your head and out of your body and, and you're, you're, you, you, for a moment, you forget that you have Parkinson's just for a moment. And that moment is worth so much. It's just a, a moment of relief. Um, I think that uh, finding things that you like to do that you can do with the minimal amount of physical effort, maybe you can't walk, maybe you're bedridden, but you can find something you can do, whether it's reading or maybe it's t editing photographs on your, from, you took from your cell phone in your, in your, you know, just right there in bed, or um, you could be drawing or painting or watercoloring. Uh, there's, uh, there's all kinds of, you know, that, that don't require. I started doing some drawing and I was having like, like, what's going to happen when I start when my tremor comes in? And I'm drawing, it's like, you know what? I'm going to let that just be part of it. That's my technique. Wow. The shaking. Why not let the shaking be there if you're, if you're shaking and you're drawing? Let, just let it be. It's, it's, it's who we are. Um, it's a technique others can't do as well as us. <laughs> Heather, you think you can go with Gavin? Oh, my gosh. These philosophers would spend, like, we wouldn't be able to pry them apart. In fact, Miguel, you have a lot of people to me. I really hope and wish that you could come to Barcelona for the World Parks. That might be a little overwhelming at first, but there are other engagements coming up. And I, would, I, I look forward to interacting with all of you because I, I just, uh, yeah. it, it's just so need you. Is it physically connected and, and, and to see everybody in person before I got off of social media, before I got off of Facebook, I was making an effort. I was, had plans to meet all the people I was friends with that I didn't actually meet. That I just I met on Facebook but didn't know them. And I got as far as uh, Stosh Machek, who you met at El Compadre, and how we met. He had a his own uh, poetry uh Facebook page called stir and you had to be a member and be approved to get in and, you know, you know, the secret handshake, but um, he was suffering a toothache. He had a 
cavity or needed a root canal or something. He was just in immense pain. I was like, do you need me to take you to County or take you to, to the ER or take you? He's like, no, 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 I can't do any of those things. I said, well, why don't you give me your address and I'll come over with a fifth of whiskey and we'll solve this problem. And so uh, sure enough, I went, that's how we met. I came to his house with a fifth of whiskey and he numbed his tooth and we had a great day. And you ripped it out. No, 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 we didn't rip it out, but he didn't feel any pain anymore. That's so cool. We can only do what we can do. Yeah. yeah old school. Yeah. Yeah. I read someplace, I, I, I have not been able to reconfirm this, but I, re- I have read that prior to modern dentistry, the leading cause of suicide was a toothache. Mm. Oh. Think about it. Wow. Alrighty, guys, we've had them for over an hour now. <laughs> Are you on any social media at all? No. But I think I'm going to have to change that. I'll put my number in the chat column right now. If you want to call me, call any time. Okay. How did we get so lucky to meet? All we have in common, the four of us, is a debilitating disease that's progressive. Yeah. Yeah, look what we have in common. Look at all the interest here. Look at. I could talk to you guys the rest of the day. I wouldn't yeah. know be bored. I feel like we're sitting around a campfire, you know? Yeah. Except I hate marshmallows. Yeah. Who brought the it's the, only, it's the only food I don't eat. I'll eat anything but marshmallows. <laughs> anything but marshmallows. That, yeah. That's one of the greatest statements I've ever heard. <laughs> I'll eat anything but marshmallows. Speaking of two things. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Miguel. Thank you, guys. And uh, hopefully I didn't uh, get anybody in trouble by naming names or saying things. But uh, I think you've got a title for this now, Mike. I'll eat anything but ma- but marshmallows. Mm-hmm. A great, job, <laughs> great title. <laughs> I approve of that title. <laughs> what, but whatever you guys come up with is, you know, uh, I trust you implicitly, however you edit this and put it together. I'm sure it'll be just fine. And, and uh, you guys are really great to, to hang out. I, I felt very stream of conscious, able, and uh, I like that kind of thing. You guys are great. I hope to meet you in person sometime. That would be awesome. Hopefully. Yes. All right, Miguel. So, you know, right. Nathan just sent me a quick message. He said, you're a cool guy. He loved meeting you. Oh, well, thank you. I feel, I feel the same about all four of you, except you're not a guy, Heather. <laughs> kind of am. <laughs> you guys are really great and really cool. Thanks. And uh, I feel really, felt really comfortable. Thank you so much. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks for the story. It'll be out in a few weeks. Good. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know before it goes off. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I'll Take care. Bye-bye. Living well starts here. 